now about to present the main attraction of our world main show. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Rain Over Me, the Atlanta Rain podcast. As always, my name is Shy Guy, and I am no joined. Shadow. Once- <laughs> there he is. It feels, it feels <laughs> sorry like- about that. I, I thought I, I thought I had an opening. I'm my bad. <laughs> you, you did. You did, and and I I closed it right on your face. So that that one's that one's on me. Um, <laughs> it it feels like it's it's been a while since since we talked last week, but I mean. It has only been one week, but it has been kind of a, a crazy one in the Overwatch right. League. Right, right. And yeah, we had a, I mean, we had so much going on that first week with the two games and opening week and the watch party and everything that we too kind of settled into a little bit more of a routine. And yeah, it feels like, you know, we're waiting for a bunch of stuff to happen because we were waiting so long for the season. But now we're here. We're in it now. Mm-hmm. There, There is just so much going on in the, the league right now. It is hard to keep up with everything which is you know part of why we're here we're, we're here to, to focus in a little bit on you know what the atlanta rain are doing and you don't uh, need to worry about the rest of them that's fine just the rain yeah. that's all you need i mean and so far uh it has it has all been been very good for the rain they, they have oh, yeah. come out of the gates and, and just really impressed from from the get-go but we will we will get into specifics of, of that a little bit later on in the episode when we go over their, their game last week. But for now, we've got just a couple of, of pieces of news that we want to touch on. I guess not news, but you know, outside content uh, that is not directly related to the, the games on the stage. And the, the first of those uh, is much, a little more general, I guess. And that is the, uh, the announcement coming this week that you know, we've got a new patch on the PTR. We've got a brand new hero about to, to show up. Yeah, and, and you know it's not specific for the rain, but I mean, this is going to be something that uh, I assume this is going to be, if this patch goes live, this may be what we see when stage two starts up. And uh, there's there's a lot there. There's a lot to unpack. I mean, this is this is a pretty major patch as far as tweaking a bunch of little heroes. And that's not even including the fact that we're getting a brand new support. Yeah, I mean, it. There is a lot of stuff going on in the, this PTR patch. We don't have anywhere near enough time to to get into right. every little thing that, that's going on. You know, one one tiny little thing that that made me happy when I saw the the patch notes was Torb get the nice, healthy little buff there to to his health pool. And yeah. as a friend of as a fan of the Fran and the Atlanta <laughs> Rain, that that makes me makes me very happy. Yeah, I'd, and uh, if, if we're pointing out our, our favorite little changes, I know this one this one's probably small compared to a lot of people, but Arissa is very close to my heart when it comes to, to heroes. And the fact that she got her speed increased a little bit when she's firing is one step closer to us getting a gallop. Because that's what I want. I want that horse <laughs> to gallop. Right? I want to be able to ride on Arissa's back. Oh my God. No, I'm just, I'm just saying like to get back to, to the point to defend, like just if you're moving forward and you don't have any, you're not shooting or anything, just start galloping. You are a pony. Run free, Arissa. <laughs> oh, that would be great. We're all well, slowly, but surely we're getting there. You know, right now we're still at a, a movement, you know, debuff, but you know, eventually we, we could get, get her galloping all the way across the map. It would be a lot of fun, but you know, we, we don't have, enough time to get into all the little intricacies here you know i, I think mm-hmm. we might see a lot more Arisa when we do uh get this new hero in there i think they synergize mm-hmm. really well together so that that's something to keep an eye on going into stage two yeah a lot of meta disruption with uh hopefully you know and i know a lot of people are trying to get mm-hmm. a, like want anything to get away from goats and we we have seen some uh, a, a lot of comps that are uh, kind of shy away from from goats a bit this season and and it's exciting so any change is probably going to reinforce that more and more but i mean this hero he has uh, aoe heal potential he has a uh, hit scan uh, primary weapon he's got with the biggest things are his very long cooldown abilities which are an, uh, an immortality field where people can't die uh, which is going to be completely negating diva bombs and things if timed well and then you have the um uh, the ultimate, which basically anything fired through this field 
is going to it just amplifies the damage or healing and that's going to be able to just shred through through shields and things like that so you know not just the the tweaks on the ptr for other heroes but again that hero right there is going to take a uh, is going to hopefully take a big knock against the uh, the comp that we're all starting to get a, a little tired of at this point and several months ago point you know yeah i i think it'll be a, a very good shake up to to how professional overwatch looks you know i i don't think we're we're gonna see a repeat of stage one when it comes to the meta uh much longer going into this season so uh, i'm very excited for what is on the, the horizon in that regard but you know for for the time being we we've got stuff happening you know right here in front of us and yeah. you know, um one thing that, that came out this week from the the rain side of things was the the very first episode of rain rising their their youtube series yeah yeah and this is this is so cool this is uh, you know i i loved in season one a lot of the teams um put out little mini documentaries about the team so you get to know them better or little q and a's with the team or or just just random little things to help fans connect with the with the players and i was really hoping that um uh atlanta would be one of those teams who who was uh putting out stuff so we could really get to, to know our, uh, our players and our coaches and, you know, what, what they're going through and if they're having a good time and stuff. And this is exactly what I was talking about. It's really well done, impeccably produced. Uh, I know, uh, Jarrell Bell and, uh, Nick Dallas are, are the people, uh, the names working behind uh, the content on this stuff and they're doing a, an amazing job. This is so professionally done and it's going to be weekly. It's going to come out every Thursday and really, Basing on the first episode, we're going to get a lot of information about, you know, not just who the players are, but what they think of the game, what they think of the matches, how they're doing out on the West Coast, how the international uh, uh, players are doing in, in the U.S. Just all sorts of really, really solid information about the players, who they are as people, and just stuff for the fans to really connect with them on. Certainly. It was a really cool opportunity to get, you know, for for me at least the first kind of look into to this team in particular and a lot of the, the players here the first time I've I've really seen a lot of them interviewed or anything like that so that that was very cool I, I do want to note uh, props to to Kodak during that that first video giving a, a shout out to the the Battle and Brew watch party uh, oh yeah yeah me me and uh, several of the the guys who uh, in, went there were were talking and we're all freaking out like oh he called he gave, gave us a shout out but he yeah, knows was, we uh, exist he knows we exist yeah like I'm I'm glad it you know obviously it's fun for us to show up and have a good time and watch them but I'm I'm really glad that they're getting encouragement from that as well certainly certainly you know that that actually reminds me I meant to to tell you this before the the episode started but speaking of of uh you know senpai noticing us uh the, the atlanta rain the official atlanta rain twitter account followed us on twitter oh just yesterday Thank so you, JP. big big moves <laughs> yeah nice nice we are we're moving ever closer up the uh up the, up the social ladder <laughs> okay so let, let's dive right into to these games let's not you know mince words anymore uh okay so we're in generation eight and there's three new starters oh wait what game? <laughs> And if I can tell you anything about my, I follow mostly Overwatch people on Twitter, but the, that Pokemon has been all over it. But yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry to derail it. That was just <laughs> no. I had to it, take the opportunity. It, it is it is always welcome here. But we <laughs> we we did have actual we had Overwatch games ah, that's uh, to right, talk about. Yeah, you know, that yeah, I know it's hard to remember, but that that is actually what this <laughs> podcast is about. Um, but yes, Atlanta taking on the the Toronto Defiant this week. And, you know, it was, I gotta say, a much closer match than, than I anticipated. If, if you remember anyone listening to last week, I, you know, we, we kind of flipped places this week. I was the one coming at it thinking Atlanta was going to get the 4-0. It was a much tougher fought series than I necessarily expected. Uh, but, you know, Atlanta was able to, to pull out the win in the end. Yeah, with the with the three one, and even with the three one, it it was the the score doesn't reflect how close the first three maps really were. Mm. Like it, like it, all of them could have kind of, with the exception of a, of a couple of rounds, maybe on Busan, where where Toronto was really really pulled together and looked good. It was really back and forth. A lot of the other matches, uh, Atlanta had some great play on Nimbani, but I mean, once we got to Horizon, it it just 
Oof, we'll, crazy. We'll, we'll get we'll get there. That was the game of the week, so we'll get there. But yeah, just I don't want anybody to look at the score and be like, oh, Atlanta's on a tear. Toronto was terrible. No, nah, man, Toronto put up a fight. They really did. But Atlanta just uh, was able to clutch it out and and get the points on the board when it mattered. You know, and you know, I gotta say, I'm I'm happy that we we got to play Toronto early in the season uh, because they are a, a scary, scary team going forward. Uh, yeah. And I'll, I'll be interested to see. Well, we'll have to have a rematch with them later on in the season. But but for now, it's good to get them out of the way right now. And I don't think they, they've kind of fully powered up yet. You know, Neko was still not in the lineup this week. Will be starting next week. So uh, we, we caught them at the right time, I think, in, in that regard. And it was a, a great series. But let's, let's jump right into Busan, which to me uh, was, you know, out, outside of horizon obviously was by far kind of the most interesting map of the day interesting is a very good way to put it interesting is a good way to put it um i mean you know there was there was moments of of strong play from both sides there was times when atlanta really came through and and did some some powerful stuff but then at the same time you have what sanctuary or the second sanctuary where like we just couldn't pull it together and and that's really what started the the real back and forth was busan but uh we started on um i think mecca base right yes it started on mecca base where, where both teams were you know showed that they were more than willing to to break out some kind of unusual stuff in terms of compositions you know you had i, I think a triple dps look from toronto uh, you know, Imlair was brought in specifically to play the Widowmaker. You know, it essentially brought in just to play this one point uh, for Atlanta, and you know they they were able to get a lot of work done. But it was just like it was so hectic because Mecha Base is this massive, massive stage, and when you've got all these DPS, the the fight never takes place in the the same location. Right, right, and yeah, and something interesting about this was when we started off, um, we really leaned into that that three two one comp with the the um, uh, multiple supports and everything. We only had Pokpo on the Hammond, which has become a a popular um, a strat for Mecha base, especially. But um, a lot of uh, uh, attacking teams going into goats for the for the crossfire, and we did not have uh, Daco, who has been you know one of the stars of the the team, but. I love that Atlanta is willing to swap out. Everybody on the team has a has a role to play, and even the players that we see is playing, you know, really, really well and and being uh, super important are being swapped out for these, you know, other compositions, these big brain comps. And um, yeah, it, it it worked. We had uh, when we needed Diva, we had Urser able to swap over there, and he did a good job. Uh, but it it was interesting going into this, um, you know, not knowing how it was going to go against Toronto and. Uh, seeing us not play that uh, uh, Daco uh, on Diva or, or an off tank because something we've talked about a lot has been the uh, um, some the the communication issues that we think may or may not happen and, and all that. So to have uh, Pokpo being the the lone um, Korean player out there and not having a solid tank line uh, is something I don't think a lot of people expected to see. And I think uh, I think we were able to to pull it off to a good extent. Yeah, I mean, they, they were definitely able to, to pull it off when, like you said, you know, Popo was playing the wrecking ball, which is kind of, uh, it, it has a little bit more of like a solo play style almost. You are, you are all over right. the place on that hero. You are harassing the, the back line. And it, it's not quite so much a, about playing, you know, directly with the team and in coordination right. with the, the rest of the squad. So I think it, it worked really well and it, and it gave... Uh, Defran and Inlayer kind of room to you know operate independently a little bit, and they they took full advantage of it at least on Mecha base. The the question that I have when you run those lineups without Daco is what does that do when you you have to go back over to Ghost because in the current meta it is inevitable like you you are gonna have to play it at some point on on most maps you know it, it is rare to to go an entire map without playing one of those comps at all. And I, I mean, I think we saw that come to bear a little bit uh, with the, the way that Toronto answered back on uh, Sanctuary and then downtown. Right, right. And, and that's the thing is that, you know, when you're playing at this level, um, you can flex, but someone, uh, Erster flexing onto the Diva role is, he, he is a, a, an amazing player, but he's not that specialist that we picked up, you know, in Daco. He, he's not going to be able to, putting him up against someone who specializes in that role, playing this meta that 
that really focuses on um, how well you play as a team in that role, it, you're not just going to be playing at the top of your game. So um, while I think it did work, and uh, I do think all these players do well, like like you said, on, on Mecha Base, Pokepo was able to, to rock the Hammond and or the Wrecking Ball and and, um, and kind of do so solo. But like you said, when, when you get forced back to that 3-3 meta, the, the 3-3 comp against another one, you, we have a sub in for a very, very um, part of that. And, and later on, we get to see how important Daco is to, the, to that comp. Right. And, and that's the thing. It, it's not a knock on, on Erster that he cannot play D.Va up to the same standard that Daco has. Like, Daco has been playing that hero for, for so, so long and is, you know, one of the, the best in the entire league at it. Exactly. To, to ask someone to come in off roll and, and fill those shoes is is going to be almost impossible. So I almost, you know, if Atlanta is going to continue uh, to run these, these, you know, types of composition where you've got those three DPS players ostensibly in the lineup, I want to see them lean into that a little bit more if they're, they're going to do it. I want to see them come out on downtown and try to run in lair on the Widowmaker again because yeah. that's, a, that's a stage where it can work. Um, right, but but they they opted into that you know three three mirror matchup and it just kind of left them on the the back foot a little bit. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that Diva does in this composition is you know the defense matrix is eating a lot of damage. Uh, you got good peel potential. You can protect your supports. And what we saw, there wasn't necessarily a problem out of damage or anything like that. But there was certain amounts of protection that we just didn't see as much of. Um, and it's something that. I'm sure Daco has a much better feel for. Again, not saying anything bad with Erster. I mean, look at DeFran. DeFran had to practice. He's one of the most mechanically gifted players in the league, and he had to practice Zarya for months to feel like he could compete. It's not just about talent, you know? Um, and and yeah, like you said, we were kind of on our back foot when we went into Sanctuary. Um, we got, you know, wiped early and and got behind on, on, on ults. And then, you know, every time we tried to get in there, like I was saying, uh, someone would get picked off or someone wasn't uh, playing quite tight enough, or we just started a little slow and, and uh, Toronto kind of tightened up a little quicker than we did. Yeah, that, that is definitely true. And I, I do want to point out, you know, Toronto was doing a really good job on Busan, especially of kind of taking the, the initiative away from Atlanta in a lot of fights. Um, you know, there, there were times I, I remember specifically there was a, a play where Roki, their Lucio player, was like riding way up on, on the, the tops of buildings on downtown and then drops down onto Poke Poke, boops him up in the air and, and opens the door for Yakpung to hit this you know, really good earth shatter that, that won them a fight. And yeah. it's, you know, taking those kind of proactive plays is much harder to do when you don't have like your normal cohesive lineup in there. Like you, you are kind of playing a, a default style almost once you make those swaps. Um, yeah. And I think we, we saw that, you know, have its effect on Busan. And, you know, I, I think that's a, a large part of why we saw Daco back in the lineup for, for every other map in the series. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And uh, just, just to kind of touch on, um, uh, you know, sanctuary, we got, um, we, we got handedly taken care, handily taken care of. We mm -hmm. took the point, I think, once from them and then immediately lost it again. I, it ended up going 100 to, I think, like 20, 30 percent, something like that. And moving to uh, moving to downtown, we had that um, we went back to the dive goats comp. And uh, that's something that, that I, I think Popo has, has struggled a little bit on, on the Winston. Like what? What do you do, have you have you noticed that a little bit? He's actually been really good on the Rhine, and uh, but his Winston has has so, shown a little bit of weakness. I know he swapped back to the Rhine later on in this uh, matchup, but, you know, so they could go Rhine v Rhine. But they started out on that Winston. Um, to, to they wanted to play that, and I was kind of uh, glad to see that that he swapped back to the Reinhardt. Yeah, I I think his Rhine kind of relative to the rest of the league puts him towards the the top. Whereas I just think like. The Overwatch League is loaded with main tanks who are just insane on Winston. Like right. it's it's kind of absurd how many good ones there are, and yeah. I don't think he gets quite as much value out of that pick. But yeah. I, I think one of the best things about Popo is his consistency between the two. Like he he's not yeah. someone that I think is is necessarily a specialist uh, right. between the two. Like his his Ryan has been the the more impressive 
hero for him so far this season. Uh, but especially as we potentially, you know, later on in the season, move away from goats a little bit, uh, I expect his Winston to to be up there as well. I, I was actually going to say the same thing. I think that um, it, it's a different beast playing Winston in, in like a dive comp than it is mm-hmm. to do that hybrid dive goats situation that they're working with. So I, I agree with you. If we can move away from from goats a bit, we we go back to some kind of dive or some kind of instance where uh, Winston is is more relevant, not playing into that three three comp or or with that three three comp. We're going to see him really start to shine a little bit more. But yeah, you're right. Like. The amount of of just insane Winston players in the league is is my the the level that they play is crazy on Winston. I, I couldn't even imagine trying to play into something like that. No, no. The one of the the things that like crystallizes my level of skill at this game more than anything else is, is watching Winston's use primal rage um, and just perfectly control someone and juggle them. And I'm just like, I I could I could never do that. that that's Literally, not my wildest dreams could I ever pull that off. When I uh, when I hit primal rage, generally, like I knock someone to the wall and then they just vanish from my sight. I'm like, okay, all right, I'm, I'm gonna swap. <laughs> okay, so we 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 started off on the the wrong foot here, but we're very quick to turn things around as yes. the the series moved over to Numbani, um, where Atlanta put in. You know, I think well. Maybe not the, the strongest showing of the series, thanks to, to Matt Four, but you know <laughs> one of their, their best kind of uh, defensive showings, at least from the entire season so far. Yeah, yeah, they they uh, they really pulled it um, pulled it together in a lot of ways. Um, that uh, w- what was it the um, when they finally did end up losing point A, it was off of uh, uh, that kind of awkward pause. Is that right? Um, I. I cannot remember if that was immediately thereafter. I thought they won the fight right after the pause. Um, oh, I thought that came in with the... Well, it, regardless, they were, uh, they were doing uh, amazing defense, and th- there was a, a, a pause during that first round. But uh, they think they uh, um, lost it with, with only a couple minutes left. And not only that, but they really, really drained the clock contesting that multiple times. No, uh, yeah, I, I actually just w- went back and watched it. It was the, the fight immediately after that pause that ended up costing them, and it was a, a kind of moment where Toronto were on the back foot, so maybe it gave them a chance to regroup a little bit and get their, their plan together at that moment. But, you know, it's a, a little unfortunate that that had any effect on the, the game whatsoever. But, yeah, to, to come out and, you know, take two minutes off the, you know, two-plus minutes off the clock on Mbani first is pretty solid. That's not necessarily a point you see full holds on very often. Um, so, you know, they, they looked very good there, but their, their streets defense to me was just incredible. Like, as soon as they got Popo back over onto that Reinhardt, uh, yeah. th- things really started to look up. Yep. They got him back on the Reinhardt, and uh, I. I want to say they won maybe a fight, I think. And, and we were, uh, we got to see Rain push all the way and stand in front of that spawn. Now, Rain is not spawn camping like Selfless did. Rain is not spawn camping even like ATL Academy did, but you saw them edge into that, like right up against the spawn room and want it. They could feel it and then be like, okay, okay, back up a little bit, back up a little bit. But it was it was good to see. It was good to see them pushing and being so aggressive and it working out for them. I think that's kind of the, the style that this team needs to be playing is that, that aggressive style because it allows the mechanical skill of the the players on this team, I think, to to shine through and to really um, make things a little bit chaotic, where I, I think they'll they'll thrive a lot throughout the season. Um, so I, I'm very happy to be seeing that and to to see them knowing when to to kind of pull back from that as well. Right, right. Just just kind of temper that aggression a little bit. And and I love seeing um, you know we we actually got to see Kodak start uh, against. Uh, um, them on Busan, but Dogman was subbed back in uh, and had some key picks. Like this is the start of um, the first round was was decent. We, we did okay. There's a couple picks starting on Numbani with these picks from Dogman going all the way through the rest of the day. Our supports were on 
fire. Mm -hmm. Like Dogman was clutching out headshots and picks that he probably should not have gotten. Like he was just finding the perfect sight lines to take people out and uh, including that amazing, you know, on defense, the last second on defense, Atlanta's pushing back, trying to contest, making sure they can't touch. And you have uh, Roki on the uh, um, uh, Lucio coming around and Dogman just charged up, hit him with a volley and one last headshot and was able to completely eliminate uh, overtime from being triggered. Yeah, it was, it was very, this was, I, I think, Dogman's best map as a, a member of the range so far this year. Um, yeah. he, he was just like the, the kill feed so often was like, you know, two, three Dogman kills in a fight. Um, and you know, he, yeah. he, he really showed up, uh, in this map in particular. And then, um, I know he didn't play on, on horizon, but did he, did he close out the series on Dorado? I can't remember which one of them was in. Uh, he, he did. Yeah, 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 yeah he did. He did. He did. Um, cause again, he was getting, he got a few key picks and actually had some, some good clutch transcendences as well that uh, helped out on Dorado. But but anyway, before, we'll, we'll we'll get to Dorado. <laughs> we we, we will um, get to Dorado. But yeah, he has uh, been very impressive so far for having kind of integrated into this team a little bit later uh, than than most. And I'm very interested in what they're doing in in regards to the support rotation. Uh, you know, it is unclear to me, just as someone who is watching the games, exactly what the intention. Uh, necessarily is between swapping Dogman and Kodak out when you know they're pretty much only playing Zenyatta the entire time. So it's not like you know hero pools or, or anything like that are really coming into play. Um, but they they've managed to find a, a good deal of success with both of them so far. So that's uh, that's I think a, a good sign for the the stability of Atlanta as a whole. Well, yeah, and actually something I uh, I can I can actually give some insight to that. Uh, this past week, um, Yiska. Uh, interviewed Kodak about you know his position on the rain, how everything's going, and what he said about him and Dogman were was that Dogman is a uh, is a more aggressive Zenyatta player. He'll go for those kills. He'll try to find those sight lines and take them out. Um, and you kind of notice that and how clutch he can be when things start getting crazy. He doesn't kind of go back and and kind of keep the plate spinning and trying to heal up. He goes and he's like, I got to make a play, and he makes those play. Where Kodak was like. Uh, he was saying that he was more of a laid back, like stay in the back line, make sure everything's good. And then the minute someone's out of position, he'll wait and snipe them all out. But he's not going to go looking for those opportunities. He's going to play his line. He's going to play it hard. But when someone makes a mistake, he's going to he's going to pick them out. So more of an aggressive style in Dogman versus a more um, support and passive style of Kodak. And um, if you kind of take keep that in mind when watching them and seeing what they do, it, it really makes sense. Like it's, that's a pretty good insight he gave there. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, that makes a lot of sense just in the, the way that they both play. And then also kind of if you look at the, the compositions that Atlanta was running, at least in this match, while the those two were swept, you know, you had Busan and Horizon for, for Kodak. And on those maps, you know, we, we, we already talked about the, the kind of the DPS looks that Atlanta was bringing out um, on Busan. So I, I think his more kind of laid back, like supportive style kind of makes a little bit more sense when you are, are trying to allow like in layer and defran to, to pop off right right and, and actually uh something we uh, just to touch back on busan real quick on sanctuary uh the rain only won one fight but it was off of kodak showing up with a, a clutch transcendence and, and getting everybody topped off and, and knowing that he could pop that so um even in that mat that we weren't looking so hot on or toronto was looking really hot on um he was still making plays and that that's really good to see um but it, not just to stop with with uh um uh, kodak and dogman though because because even masa he he especially started shining on horizon mm -hmm. but um he it, masa was an interesting uh a person specifically on Nimbani when we started pushing because uh if you remember we we pushed in and we were going top we were, we were pushing through the hallway up top and he got picked off early he got picked off early, so so the rain backed off, and they're like, all right, let's wait on Lucio. And they were, it looked like they stopped at the stairs and looked and were like, guys, why don't we just push main? And they wrapped around the corner, pushed main, kind of caught Toronto off guard, and that was that first little pick and that uh, ability to readjust when he got back was what allowed them to take that point. Yeah, so, I mean, they, it, it's that is a, a good example of just some adaptation on the fly from Atlanta there to 
to kind of recognize how Toronto is holding and to, to take advantage of it. So um, I'm, I'm glad to see that. That's the kind of thing that I would have perhaps worried about a little bit when we, we talked about before the season started, the, the kind of communication barriers between the teams, those kind of mid round calls. Um, yeah, I, I think exactly. is the, the hardest thing to communicate in situations like that. Uh, you know, if you don't have the, the language there, um, so the the fact that they're doing that already is a, a really good sign, and you know, the, they were able to to take Numbani off the back of that you know incredible defense. They they got the the payload far enough and pretty you know handily took that map to to tie up the series before we headed into one of the most ridiculous maps I've I've seen in the Overwatch League. <laughs> it was so much fun. It was so much fun. Uh. <laughs> Yeah. So Horizon Lunar Colony, uh, the you know, the very first thing that we see on this map is Defran breaking up the the Bastion for the defense. Oh my god! Oh my god. It was like the the uh, the the Bastion Arisa comp that we uh, we got to see um, something that uh, ATL Academy did a lot on. Uh, um, uh, god, I'm blanking here. Well, anyway, that's something that uh, that they did a lot uh, during the contender season. And um, Hanamura, there we go. Hey, nailed it. Uh, that's something they did a lot on Hanamura, and it showed a lot of a lot of success. Um, the combination of being able to hide behind the wall or the the Arisa barrier and stay mobile when you need to get off that ledge when you're getting getting a uh, dove on and everything like that. Um, didn't work out great for first point, but worked out a lot better for point B. Um, I, I, they they took uh, they took the first point pretty uh, pretty quickly. Um, we, we were able to get around that and kind of uh, not be affected too much by uh, by Defran. But uh, point B, they swapped um, in layer from. Uh, what was he on a, a widow to begin with? Because they swapped him yes. to a May for point B. Yeah, he was he was and on widow that, to start out. And that Bastion uh, Orisa May combo that they pulled off, where they were just constantly annoying the hell out of them, uh, walling them off, ripping them apart, was just so much fun to watch and a key defense and, and why they were able to take so much time from Toronto. I mean, it's such a, a smart setup, in, in my opinion. You know, sitting in the, that back corner with the the bash in the Arisa, there's no way that the the offense is ever going to be able to kind of burn down that shield in order to get to Defran. So the the only option at that point for them was, you know, what they ended up doing most of the time, which was try to wrap all the way up underneath them, go up the those back stairs. Uh, but you know, Inlayer just made this all kind of work with you know his walls on that defense. He he really kind of made it so, so hard for Toronto to, to get up into Fran's face and, and really do anything about him. Right. And, and like, it's, it wasn't even just the splitting the team up when they got to face to Fran. It was literally, they would try to enter the side room and they'd get walled off and have to wait. And they'd get into the side room and get walled off and have to wait. And then they'd get up top and then get walled off and separated and have to wait. And it was just, even if they took the fight when they finally got there, the amount of time being stripped from Toronto by just these annoying, well-placed walls, because they knew exactly where they were going. There's one path that the the uh, offense could take to get to your team, and they were just slowing them down as much as possible. Yeah, it was it was really fun to watch something that is such a a kind of specific strategy. It is so built around the the geometry of Horizon and the way that you know attackers need to approach this point. Uh, and to to take full advantage of that, you know, shows a lot of creativity uh, for the rain. And you know, the fact that they can break something out like this on a map, and then still also be able to swap back to the the three three meta to swap back to the the more you know, normal traditional picks pretty seamlessly is, is really impressive. Yeah, yeah, for for sure. And one really fun part about that composition was the the different things that they managed to uh to pull off one of which was the uh the was it a boop or was it the wall that knocked reinhardt off because we we wasted one of their shatters by knocking them off the ledge when they were trying to attack the friend on that bastion it i'm was pretty insane. sure it was the the orissa halt from Pope ah Pope. okay oh thank 
Lupo? Yes! But yeah, like, just, it was so much fun seeing the, because he dropped the hammer from the ledge and had to go all the way down and hit the point. And it was just so much fun to see. And then um, it was a different push, but uh, again, um, another big boop where a Reinhardt was playing into us and Masa out of nowhere just boops the Reinhardt and the whole team out of the way and we're able to rip him up from there. So it was, God, lots of boops, lots of pulls, lots of just fun times. But yeah, that was, um, so Toronto was able to finally push through and cap both points. And then the rain went out on offense. And uh, this was where Kodak really started turning on the fire. And uh, a lot of the pushes came into like, you just randomly see him find someone out of position, get a headshot, random, find someone here. They were dead. And it really gave Atlanta the opportunity to, uh, to push in on that on point A. Yeah, that, that is definitely true. And, you know, he would, he would wind up coming up big for Atlanta multiple other times in terms of getting, you know, crucial first pickoffs later on in this, uh, in this particular map. But, you know, he, he really did kind of blow things wide open for them. It, it definitely slowed down quite a bit once we, we got to be Toronto's defense once again. Oh, yeah. Looked really, really strong uh, on point B. And it, it got a, a little bit dicey for Atlanta there, the, the very end of their offense. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, uh, they definitely, uh, Atlanta ended with less time than Toronto to push. I think it was, what was it like a minute for Atlanta and then just over two minutes for Toronto going into the, the second round. Was that? Yeah. Was that so yeah, it, it was, it was something like that. It, you know, I think Atlanta even went under uh, a minute remaining when they actually capped out the second point, obviously they get pushed back yeah. up to that. Um, so, so yeah, the setup here is that both teams have capped both points. So it's two to two. Atlanta has about a minute. Toronto has about two minutes. Everyone probably thinks that this is just going to be maybe one team gets that point A cap and that's who wins. Oh, no, we're, we're not even close to done. We're not even not, close to done. <laughs> not on horizon. Not on horizon. We are not anywhere close to done because, you know, this is a map and we, we saw this play out over the course of you know, not one, but, but two extra rounds of attacking that, you know, when your team is able to come on to first and win the, the first fight as the attacking team, you have set yourself up at a massive, massive advantage rolling into point B. Uh, and it can, it can really make the, the difference if you can just, you know, immediately snowball. Yeah. And, and we got, um, we actually survived the, uh, uh, that first push and we're able to take the point in our, our well our second push rather but we were able to take point a because kodak was able to build his uh his transcendence so quickly and kept them alive and after he got that transcendence and after the team was able to stay alive through the the uh, defense from toronto we went up masa was able had to pop his um his beat but we rolled, like you were saying, snowballing and carrying momentum. We rolled into point B with four ults, all three tank ults and a rally. And we were able to cap it as well, just carry that over. And quickly, it didn't look anything like the first push where we got held so hard. We took them out and yeah, we were able to uh, take two points pretty much off the bat. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you, you mentioned Kodak got the, the transcendence that helped them get point A on the, the second attack. and. You know, it was his fragging ability in large part that, that helped Atlanta get point B because, you know, we, we did roll in with all of those ultimates, but they did not provide a lot of kills, like, immediately. Yes, right. it, it got Toronto kind of in a, a bad situation, and they, they were on the back foot from that point on, but Kodak was the, the one kind of securing. He got the, yeah. the first kill in that fight. Uh, continued. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, that was, that was huge for Atlanta, and you know, if you had told me at, at that point we were only about halfway through the, the scoring <laughs> uh, for this map, you know, I, I would not have believed you, but we, we still had a long way to go. And, and something really fun about that second cap was we capped it with, like, I wouldn't even say, like, a split second is too long. They had grabbed Atlanta onto the point. And Zarya was in the process of jumping onto the point when we capped it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it could have, if, if it would have been a little bit different, if the boops would have been lined up, you know, we may not have gotten that one. But again, clutch plays. And, and like I said at the very beginning of this, Atlantic knows how or, or they keep finding the important things when it matters.
That is definitely true. The the amount of times on this map alone that they kind of clutched up at the the last minute was you know almost too many to count. Um, and it it definitely came through on the the third round of attacks after yeah. Toronto. You know they they had about two minutes to work with the the second time around, and were were because of that uh, were were actually afforded the luxury of losing a fight on on point B, which you know was. Well played by Atlanta, uh, but Toronto had enough time in the the bank to come back through and eventually take point B and force us to to yet another round here. Right, right. So everybody, we we were at, everybody's out of time. We everybody got uh, a minute over, and um, yeah, it, nobody like you said, nobody really expected it to go to a third push for either team, especially with how hard the teams held uh, the first round. Um, but I really feel like this this right here, when Toronto took that second point and we tied up 4-4, was a huge turning point in the entire mat the day, the day of, of, of matches. Because this is where Atlanta seemed like they decided to just, okay, we're done with this. We're we're putting this to rest. No, uh, no more no more playing around at this point in time to to really get serious about it. Although I guess the there was a little bit of playing around, if if that's what you consider the the Bastion shenanigans. Um, but you know, they they really buckled down going into to that second offense, um, and this was where I, I think you know Massa had one of the the most you know game breaking like Lucio plays I have seen in the league all season. I, I think you you kind of mentioned this in passing earlier, yeah. uh, but when Atlanta rolled out, Toronto was set up on a high ground. And he completely separated Yachpung from the, the rest of his team uh, and allowed Atlanta to get that first, uh, that crucial first elimination that, that kind of blew everything wide open. Yeah. And, and can I just say, watching Masa just get blood in his eyes and like go, <laughs> just can taste it. And he wants, he's like, I want that boop. I want that kill. Cause you'll see every now and then, you'll just see his name pop up in the kill feed where he was like, nah, I'm not letting this guy get away. Or like, nah, this guy's getting booted somewhere, and it's he's he plays where he needs to play. But when it's time to get aggressive, it's so much fun to watch him work. Because yeah, he saw an opportunity. He saw that they were on the high ground, and and this was an opportunity to split people off, and he executed perfectly. Um, and that was actually the there was two on this on this push. There were two huge massa plays. That was one of them. And the second one was actually on point B, uh, where, um, cause yeah, cause we got six points by the way, but as we were pushing point B for the third time, um, they had, they had built up uh, Ivy, I think, cause there's already a player on Toronto. He had built up a, uh, a grav. And if that grav would have landed, uh, it would have been serious trouble for Atlanta. But if you, like I paused it, I went back and rewound. Masa comes in and boots him back right as he's about to hit Grav, and he completely whiffs the Grav. Doesn't hit a single person on Atlanta, and that is one of the things that helps them clean up the point and, and not get taken down. And it was, oh my god, Masa was amazing on Horizon. Yeah, he, he, he really showed his stuff and why he is, I think right now, considered one of the best Lucio players in the entire league, and you know, why he is... The I think the one person on the team who is uh, also I guess DeFran I think has also played every game, but I was gonna say he's one of two people on the reign who has played every single map. Right, right, and I mean with with how important because Masa, you know, he's an amazing Lucio player, amazing support player and player in general, but also his ability to track ultimates and to kind of shot call and stuff like that is is just invaluable. You know, it's it's something that that I keep hearing is super important now atlanta is if i remember correctly one of the teams that's running you know plays instead of having to actively shot call in the moment as far as like we need to do this we need to do this that's not going on as much because uh they're setting up plays uh kind of like the arisa bastion thing let's run this play which is is very interesting um it's a very interesting discussion on its own about you know how uh traditional sports techniques are lending themselves to to overwatch strategy but um but still the his, his abilities to track what's going on in the game, his game sense, ult tracking, all of that. I think that's why we're seeing so much of Masa is because not even just his gameplay, but what he does on the mic behind the scenes is, is so important. Yeah, that, that was kind of the, the reason that everybody had for why uh, he got picked up in the first place was his you know, shot calling ability. So uh, that 
as of right now, is bearing a lot of fruit for Atlanta along with you know his his you know absolutely nutty mechanics. Yeah, and and something that a lot of people may have missed on this, Daco was back in for Horizon and did a phenomenal job. He's it's one of those players and one of the the heroes where you know if you're doing everything right, people sometimes might not have an easy time following it because you're not doing things actively you're preventing things from being done to your team you're peeling you're you're eating things you're you're uh, preventing picks from happening and you're you're knocking people out of the way so the rest of your team can knock them out so uh, but if you sit and watch Daco, especially on horizon dude was on fire like much like a lot of the other players he was he was killing it yeah he he absolutely was and you know that put Atlanta in a really solid position headed into the, the last map of the series, which as we, we mentioned a little bit earlier was Dorado. Yeah. And Dor- Dorado was a, uh, like I said, you know, it was a turning point on horizon because we were able to, you know, air quotes, full hold Toronto, uh, on their third push. They got the, the first four points, but we did <laughs> hold them a point a, um, or during that last overtime push. And, they didn't really have a whole much more in them after that stamina wise. Uh, whereas Atlanta looked like they could have gone for, they could have gone to a map five <laughs> if they needed to. Cause like, yeah. uh, and it was hard because we started out on, on offense and, you know, long story short, we just kind of kept moving. Some of the fights were a little drawn out and we did struggle a little bit on that first big, uh, the choke that, that uh, archway uh, on Dorado. But after that, I mean, some prolonged fights and Toronto did okay here and there, but we kind of just marched the point all the way to the end of C. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of colloquial. I don't really have a, a ton of like data to back this up just from watching games throughout the season. Toronto doesn't seem like a, a, a map that teams are, are necessarily finishing all that often. I've seen a ton of holds at the end of point B, even you know full holds like the, the one we have here. Um, right on point A, but you know, Atlanta finished with over a minute remaining in their time bank on Dorado, which was you know, really impressive, especially considering, like you said, they, they did lose a fair bit of time on point A. They, they had uh, just a, a few hiccups there to, to slow them down, but you know that, that defense in particular was, was really, really impressive. Oh yeah, and it, like that was that was the thing. We we marched it after that first that first hold that they had. We were able to march it all the way to see with time left on the clock. And uh, yeah, when they started pushing in, they just kind of looked scattered. I mean, Dogman was finding kills. He was back in. He was doing great on his transcendences. Uh, I saw Massa a few times get some. You know, he tracked some people down, got some headshots on people, and. Yeah, we we looked like we were kind of just getting our wings spread, and and Toronto was getting stressed out. Like they they knew this was the end. They had to they had to do everything they could to to try to make plays and this that the other. And Atlanta was just playing their game, you know. Yeah, I mean that is definitely true. I think you know maybe maybe Toronto was a little bit broken by by getting full held by the Bastion, like you mentioned. They they were. Uh, I don't know why they were upset. I enjoyed it. <laughs> I. I <laughs> No, I, I don't know. I, I can't tell you. They. It seems like they should have had a great time, but <laughs> maybe not. And you know, uh, Atlanta just looked. Th- this was by far, obviously, the, their best map of the series, where uh, it was kind of dominance on on both sides. Whereas every map up to this point was either you know, Nimbani, Their defense, I think, was incredible. The the offense had some some struggles. Horizon, the the offense, you know, put six points on the board, uh, but you know, you you gave up four. So uh, th- this was kind of the complete effort from Atlanta. This is this is kind of the ceiling for them as a team. Like this is if they can play up to this level more often, then they are absolutely one of the best teams in the league. Yeah, absolutely. And and um, uh, I like something I, I want to point out that last map versus Toronto that looked like it could have been versus versus uh, mayhem. But the the biggest difference is that something I talked about when we were talking about it with the Philly game is that Atlanta. I was I was a little hesitant on um, you know our our payload maps. We didn't do too hot on payload maps. We better work on those payload maps. What were our two best maps? We held them hard on Numbani. 
and we kicked the crap out of them on Dorado. I think we were working on those payload maps. <laughs> yeah, they definitely put some time into those uh, going into this week, and it absolutely paid off for them. Uh, and you know, now this game, this is the only game for for Atlanta this week, and it it now leaves us sitting, you know, right up there at the the tippy top of the standings. Yeah, as, as um a few people, a few journalists have pointed out, uh, the top three teams uh in general and that's vancouver new york and paris who are you know undefeated they they are pretty set like those are the top three teams everything after that seems a little bit dicey and and more like a uh you know it could go either way i personally obviously my bias is going to show through i think atlanta is kind of rising to the top of that middle group because that middle group goes deep i'm not talking about like you know number four (laughs) through number 10 i'm talking about number four through like number 16 but Atlanta is definitely set at the, the front of that group, and they have been kind of rising above some of the teams that people think they may have been better than. I think Atlanta absolutely looks better than Philly right now, and we lost to Philly. Um, but yeah, I think that Atlanta is the best non-undefeated team, the best defeated team. I don't, know, I don't like that. Yeah. Best non-undefeated <laughs> team. And um, we're going against Paris this week. We're going up yeah. against one of the undefeated teams, and this is, I mean, the good news here is that very few scenarios do we come out of this looking really bad. I mean, if we get if we get 4 out, if we get stomped, that comes out looking bad. But Paris has shown dominance. And if we can go toe-to-toe, if we can push them even to a map 5, I think that that will solidify, okay, maybe they're not, maybe they can't beat Paris, but with a showing like that against Paris, they deserve to be maybe number 4. They deserve to be right there in the top five um because a lot of people are saying that atlanta you know it's just one game away from being like ah they're not that good but we're also one game away from being like maybe they are and i think paris could be that game but you know on the flip side if we beat paris we've punched our ticket into everything yeah we've punched our ticket into the the like the conversation now like we 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 have put ourselves up there uh with the the truly the best teams in the league at that point and and it will be impossible for anyone to kind of ignore that as a statement yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that's when you know you're going to be looking at um, uh, down the road, and and when Atlanta starts to to look to play, um, you know, Vancouver, and when Atlanta starts to look to play New York, if and, and that that I don't think we play either of them this stage, so it's going to go through some meta development and stuff. But uh, yeah, if we can beat Paris, it's not going to be like well they're going up against Vancouver. So, you know, I expect them to lose, but maybe they could put up a good showing. It's going to turn into, is this going to be the game that Vancouver loses? And that's where I think Atlanta deserves to be talked about. I I think they can give, Vancouver is looking really strong right now. Vancouver, Mm -hmm. in my opinion, is the best team in the league. Um, We would have a hard time up against Vancouver, in my opinion, but I think we could beat New York and I think we can beat Paris. Right. I, I think Vancouver right now looks incredibly polished. Paris, I still I want to, to see a little bit more of. I mean, they are in a unique situation where they've only played two games through two weeks. Um, right. So we don't have you know an insane amount of footage on them. What we do have uh, is really, really good. They, they look incredible uh, in you know, GOAT's compositions. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, Atlanta has shown more versatility on that front and that, that could become a factor in this matchup and you know it, it's not like we we are slouches on, on goats by any means right right and yeah that's that's the thing is paris has shown a little bit of flexibility uh, but their their strongest like you said is the uh is that three three that goats comp and um that the thing that makes people good at goats is their ability to play as a team and that paris as we know is a, a strong european roster and they have a lot of synergy and they are looking i mean they made London look bad. I mean, <laughs> they, they, they've been doing great stuff. And um, I think that if we rely on goats v. goats against them, it's going to be pretty rough. But I think we have more versatility than them. And I think that we have more uh, uh, potential for hero plays. I think our support line uh, can, is going to be monumental in in picking people off that are in the wrong place or exploiting things. And uh, yeah, I, I think I think this is going to be one of the, uh, uh, if you're excited about Philly, I think the match versus Paris is going to be one of the best in the uh, best in the stage. 
Yeah, this is definitely in my mind the the match of the week going yeah, into week sure. three. You know, I, I'm pretty sure both of these teams only have this one game to prepare for this week, so that that makes me very excited because you, you know that you will be getting uh, the best from both sides. So that uh, is you know very good. Uh, I think you know headed into this, and I, I think we've got. A chance here Atlanta does to really uh, assert themselves because you know like you said that our, our schedule has not necessarily been like the the hardest the the one really good team we've played so far uh we we did lose to Philly in that that one so this yeah. is this is our chance to to take down you know one of those top top tier teams uh and and really kind of prove that that we belong in the conversation for uh one of the best in the league I agree. And, and like just Philly has been really streaky and that's one concerning thing is they, they looked really good against us, but they kind of faltered a little bit, but Paris is again, they've only played two games, but they've looked really consistent. Like every, every round of those games has looked consistent. And um, the, the two people that I am, that we really need to shut down, let's say uh, in my opinion, are been best uh, on uh, probably that Reinhardt more than anything is he's been scary on and Cruz who uh, got brought over on this on support. Uh, he has been uh, crazy important when it comes to uh, clutch uh, beats and things like that. And, and I am really interested to see what that uh, Cruz v uh, Massa matchup looks like. Yeah, absolutely. You know, those are our two very you know big brain European Lucios who have been forged in the fires of the goats meta. So uh, seeing them go head to head and toe to toe is going to be a treat this week. Um, and the, this game should, you know, absolutely live up to the hype. Yeah. And as people know, in Atlanta, we enjoy our chicken and waffles. So we're going to fry them, serve them over waffles, and it'll be a delicious time. It'll be great. So. That leads us to our predictions. What do you think is going to be happening at the end? When, when we settle, when the dust settles, I think this is what we're going to look like. Well, uh, I'll start this off by saying I think this is headed to, to five, no matter what. Okay. The, okay. This, in my mind, is going to be an incredibly close matchup, no matter how it actually plays out. You know, you you could convince me that you know Paris maybe comes out. Uh, and, and really just look so strong on goats that it's impossible to to take a, a second map off them. But I think if we can do that, if we can force it to a map five, that's where I think our, our strength might lie in terms of the, the versatility that we can bring to the table. If we can go to a map like Busan or like Nepal, where you know we have an opportunity to let our, our individual talents loose and kind of unleash them, I, I think that could be us taking a map five. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a little bit of a limb here, and I, I think Atlanta takes it three two. That's I, I love it. I love the optimism. Yes, stick with it. Um, all right. So mine's mine's a little weird. I was looking at these maps and I was trying to figure out how I think this is going to go. And I agree this is going to be super close. But I'm going to call the ever so rare 2-1. I mm -hmm. think we are going to actually end up uh, um, tying on, on one of these points. I, I could see us um, uh, maybe both pushing it on, um, on Hollywood. Maybe something happens on Temple of Anubis where neither can cap the second or third push on a point A. But I, I don't know. I, I think that these teams line up so well that not just the back and forth, uh, all the maps in the game is going to be close. I think we're going to have close enough individual maps where we're going to tie on one, and this is going to be decided uh, on Route 66. And I think Atlanta, with the work they've been putting in on uh, payload maps, from what I can tell based on the last couple of weeks, I think we're going to be able to take it. So, yeah, I, I'm going for the ever-elusive 2-1 Atlanta wins uh, with a tied map between the two. It is it is definitely possible. Eh? Very much in in the cards, I could see. You know, on the the assault map so far this year, uh, neither of our three have have wound up being a tie, but all three of them have been extremely extremely close. Yeah, yeah. 
And uh, I, I, I feel good about my predictions. My, my week one prediction, we didn't know how the team played. I went three, I guess three one. We ended up getting that four zero, so I was off. The week two, I literally was off by a couple of seconds. I feel like. And then I, I called it, or excuse me, game two of week one. And then week two, I, I called the, uh, I called the three one. So I'm feeling good. I'm feeling like I kind of got my, my, my uh, fingers on the pulse here. So next week when we get back in, in Atlanta one two one, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm going to be the, the oracle of the show until yeah, at, you know, at, so. at, at that point I, I, I bow down. I'm, I'm, gonna try, I'm just gonna start making you go first, and I'll copy all of your picks at that point. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm the I'm the Bren of the Oracle Bren of the uh, the Rain Over Me podcast. Yeah. Okay, so with, with that, I, I think that is just about going to do it for us here this week. Thank you to to everyone who joined us for this episode. It has been a pleasure bringing you Rain Over Me. Uh, it has been a, a really fun time doing this all season yeah. long. And uh, I just, I, I cannot wait uh, for the, the remainder of the season. You know, we, we've still got so much to learn about the, the rain as a team and, and all of their opponents as well. So it has, has been very fun so far and it, I, I'm, I'm only getting more and more excited for it. Yeah, me too. And, and as we, uh, as we're pushing through the stage and, you know, the season definitely, but the stage in general, we're going to start probably next week. We're going to have to have a conversation about where we think we lie going into uh, stage playoffs because it's, it's, uh, it's coming up. And honestly, after Paris, I think all we have left is, is Chengdu and uh, Houston, which I think we could take those uh, handedly. So, Well, we've got a game against Gladiators. Oh, we do have Gladiators. That's right. I missed that, that one. That's our, that's our seventh game. So there, there is still you know, one very, very major speed bump on, on the way to a, a very uh, solid stage one, but you know, they're, they're I got my eyes set start. on the, the playoffs. I got my eyes set on the playoffs. I, I think they, they seem like they're in really good spot to make that right now. We don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but it is, yeah, it is very much in the cards. If, if Atlanta can maintain their current form, uh, it, it is a very, very real possibility. But yeah, but it, it all kind of hinges. Let's, let's see what happens this weekend. I'm looking forward to it. All right. So as always, you can uh, follow the show at Rain Over Me Pod on Twitter. You can find me as well at Shy Guy O W and Norchetto. Hit him with your deets as well. Oh, uh, just Norchetto all over the place. Just type Norchetto into Google. If there's a there's an account, click follow, and you'll you'll probably find me. Yeah. So YouTube uh, at Norchetto, Instagram at Norchetto, Twitter at Norchetto, Norchetto at Norchetto, all those things. And as always, you know. Got got to got to plug the the game house for all of your Overwatch needs. You know, if you are a fan of teams outside of Atlanta, like I am, uh, as well. You know, we we've got news on on literally every team. We've got coverage on everybody. So if if yeah. you are just kind of an Overwatch fanatic like we are, uh, that is the the place to be. Yeah, absolutely. And and like the the what they're doing over there, and and the team that we're on with. Uh, um covering each individual team is, is really bringing out a lot of focus for the, the fan community so they can, they can follow this stuff. It's not just generalized articles or, you know, you might see one about your team this week, maybe not. We're actually, we're, we're being able to provide something for, for each of those communities. And specifically, I would go give Dave Grove a follow because, you know, he's the Toronto writer and he, he's having a rough week after we, uh, <laughs> after we shut them down. <laughs> well, now, now we can go back to, to kind of cheering for him and, and for them a little bit. Because uh, that is that is a team that has, uh, in, in a lot of similar ways to Atlanta, in my mind, kind of exceeded expectations out of the gate. Looked a lot better than I necessarily expected, uh, right from the, the start of the season, and they've been really fun to watch. Yeah, and, and for the record, that was a joke. I actually respect the hell of Dave. For oh the yeah, stuff he's done. He's he's uh, he's put out a lot of really good content. A lot of really good content. Yeah, for, for sure, for sure. But once again, thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful week. Have a good one, guys. Let it rain. I want to play you another one. Really? Yes. Yeah. Really? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I want to play you another one. Really?